So welcome everyone to our end of course roundup. My name is Gillian Dow. And my name's Kim Simpson. And let's start with a little quotation read from my coffee mug. The person, be it gentleman or lady, who has not pleasure in a good novel must be intolerably stupid. Let's put this out of the way. So we've really enjoyed reading your comments uh, this week and last week as well. You've had absolutely loads to say um, and we've actually learnt a lot as well reading through uh, the things that the things that you've said. Yes, it's worth pointing out that this is our first time designing and facilitating a, um, a, a course like this and in, in lots of ways it's been overwhelming really, the diversity of the participants, the, the backgrounds you're coming from and the, and the level of engagement with the steps of the course has been really impressive and mm -hmm. I think somewhat surprising to us so thank you for that. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, and we'd like to remind you as well that you can carry on commenting. Um, the uh, the message boards from week one are still very much um, alive and, mm. and going on. Um, and whenever you uh, sign in, you've actually got another four weeks to, to participate in the course. So we'd encourage you to keep, uh, just to keep commenting, keep involving yourselves in the discussions. Um, and we'll keep looking back and, and, uh, and seeing what you've been saying as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Um, it won't be formally moderated after the 6th of, of May, but you do have, as Kim says, four weeks from when, you, from, from when you join to keep engaging with the material. And of course, if you would like to formally upgrade and have um, continued access to the material of the course, that is an option that's open to you. Yes, yeah, so I suppose we should um, move on then and talk a little bit about um, some of the some of the comments that you've all been making. I think um, Alison and Amy did a really good job last week of picking up on some of those fascinating conversations that you were having um, about women's education, about uh, class, about the publishing industry as well. Mm. Um, and there were a few uh, sort of bits that we wanted to um, to pick up on. So I think um, one of our participants, uh, Triana Barring. Uh, made a really interesting uh, comment about um, men and music in Austin's day. I don't know if you saw that as well. I did indeed. Gillian. Yes. Um, and I think thinking about um, kind of uh, the thinking about the way that men are participating in uh, music, in particular in Austin's novels, um, actually was really interesting for me. I hadn't really thought about it that much before. Um, but they're participating primarily as listeners, and actually the men who do kind of engage with um, music do so kind of primarily out of the the narrative, but. Um, in ways that signal sort of slightly improper behaviour. I think they're using it as sort of flirtation uh, uh, devices. Ab absolutely, and Frank Churchill's gift of the piano <laughs> yeah. to, to Emma... F um, um, Jane Fairfax. Jane Fairfax, <laughs> goodness me, goodness me. Um, Jane Fairfax in the novel Emma is a very good example of that. You know, um, he, he, he wants to encourage her to display herself. And of course, there's a real debate about that in um, writing on education in the period, isn't it? How much is female accomplishment to do with display? Mm -hmm. to do with um, doing the work of attracting a suitor and, and snaring a, a, a marriage partner and then one can leave it off and, and I, I made a comment in response to um, someone who was engaging with this part of the course saying of course we need to remember Lady Middleton who um, was apparently a fairly accomplished pianist in her youth but gives all of that <laughs> up the moment she gets married. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was a really interesting um, part of the course for us to, to think about in response to your questions. Mm -hmm. I particularly enjoyed the level of engagement with contemporary reviews of Austen's novel and using that wonderful database of um, production, circulation and reception. Um, that's not a resource that's linked to the course. I mean, that's available to you anytime. And I always find it fun to look up the reception of these novels when they were first published. Um, Kim, was there anything you wanted to bring up in, 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 in response to those? Um... I think um, some, of the, uh, some of the reviews, the differences between, um, I think, uh, some of the reviews of Austin um, and then some of the reviews of self-control were picked up on, um, mm. the very positive reviews of, uh, of Austin. And it, it just sort of brought to mind um, some of the less positive reviews that I'd read on um, gothic fiction, particularly Ooh, on the Minerva yes. Press <laughs> yeah. um, uh, publications. Um, we put some of them in the gothic exhibition at Chawton. Yeah. Um, and again, it's, I think it's very interesting thinking about how um, even the positive reviews of Austin's first novels are still very much kind of invested in that idea of her as a domestic writer. Yeah. Um, so... I think a couple of people kind of picked up on how much focus there was on Mr. Bennett, um, and I, yeah, I don't know what your what your thoughts on that are, but it seems to me that they're trying very much to make Austen seem 
um, a very domestic writer. Ab- ab- absolutely, and and stressing the respectability. I mean, it, it, it's it's worth thinking more broadly about what the purpose of reviewing is mm-hmm. in this period. Um, reviewing as a as a as a practice is relatively recent. The two main eighteenth century reviews, the Monthly Review and the Critical Review, don't start being published until seventeen forty nine and seventeen fifty. So you know, this is a this is a tradition that's relatively recent. And their aim is to be comprehensive. They want to review everything that's being published, the whole of the literary marketplace, um, and that quickly becomes impossible for them. That It's not possible to do that. And actually reviewing novels is not a priority for them. Um, and you sometimes get one-line reviews of the sort of gothic or sentimental novels you're talking about that say this would find place in a hairdresser's, you know, really damning, yeah, or a circulating (laughs) library, really, really damning stuff. So I think that's interesting. Um, Lots of uh, people in the comments picked up on, wow, this is giving the plot away. But I suppose the important thing to think about there is, um, is, fiction as a commodity it's expensive Mm. you want to make sure that when you're buying a triple decker novel um it will be worth your investment and it will be safe to give to your wife and daughters Mm -hmm. to read Mm -hmm. so often the critics are designing these reviews they're they're targeting them at the male reviewer and at a at a consumer who will be um investing in this material so that that's why you get this sort of comprehensive coverage and and um what we would now call plot spoilers <laughs> yeah. um so moving on slightly then mm. i think there were some also um very interesting comments in the uh the Austin's Dirty Walks um, section. Um, we've just sort of started beginning a conversation about uh, modernity in Mansfield Park um, and how kind of la- descriptions of landscape are tied into that. And I think that's got the potential to be a really interesting um, discussion developing. Um, and also, I think somebody made a, an excellent point that in a lot of Austin's novels, um, the movement out into a kind of wilderness um, also coincides with the breakdown of. Um, uh, social norms, basically, or, or um, proper behaviour, and I thought that was just a really interesting way of thinking about how Austin's making use of space um, in yeah. her novels. Yeah, absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely, and 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 of course, um, we always think of her. I mean, it, it inspired very much by Virginia Woolf as as a uh, um, safe domestic spaces, the conversation of women in a drawing room. But it's not always that, and it's worth paying attention to when that's not what's happening, mm-hmm. because it's often a key plot moment, isn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, so other things from um, from week one, I suppose there's the big controversy over um, over portraits um, of Jane Austen, which I actually found really, really interesting. I yeah. Yeah, really enjoyed um, reading, uh, reading your thoughts on that. Some people were entirely sort of um, of the mind that what Austen looked like did not matter at all, whereas other people, um, I think, very much kind of uh, involved themselves in that activity mm. and enjoyed mm. drawing and sort of feeling, um, feeling close to... Um, or feeling like they were getting close to to um, the author. Yes, mm. yeah, absolutely. And I think I think this ties back to basic approaches to literary fiction, really. Whether one thinks that um, the author should be dead, and that and that one reads their works um, in a very formalist way, um, without any knowledge of who wrote them, that the that the text stands on its own or whether our readings are informed by a knowledge of biography, Mm. um, which ties in quite nicely to the section on biography when we were thinking very much about how do we know what we think we know about Jane Austen? Because of course, as Catherine Sutherland, um, who's done a great deal of work on early biographies of Jane Austen herself, as she points out, Almost everything we know about Jane Austen is mediated by her family, by the descendants of her brothers, um, by Cassandra, the recipient of the only um, authentic voice that we have of Jane Austen, you know, her own letters. Um, but it's worth it's worth thinking about the gaps in those letters, mm. actually. I mean, we think we know um, things about her life. Um, so, for example, I think... I'm, certain it was Simon Henderson who said very early on in the course um well of course Jane Austen um had a very productive writing career um in Steventon and then the great rupture happens they move to Bath they move to Southampton they have this very itinerant lifestyle and then it's on and settling in Chawton that she takes up her pen again we don't 
actually know that and again it's Catherine Sutherland who's pointed out very recently that that um there are so few facts known about her life in that time that why not see her writing career as continuous how do we know what she was doing in Bath or, or Southampton there's very little actual archival evidence that will give us that information mm -hmm. I always like to point um to, to point students to the fact that in terms of her letters she arrives in Chawton the village of Chawton in 1809 and then there isn't a single letter not one until 1811 mm -hmm. and that must surely have been a really productive moment in terms of her writing I mean she's working up to the publication of Sense and Sensibility she must be working some more on Pride and Prejudice the ideas for Mansfield Park and Emma must be brewing and we don't know anything about it at all mm, mm. so what yeah what she was doing in that in that period mm. is actually um, entirely unknown to us exactly um, but subsequently exactly. the gaps have been sort of filled yeah, in or exactly for that, and suppose. early biographers did a did a one did a wonderful job in kind of tracing um, her, her life but any biography must almost by definition be speculative mm -hmm. Um, there's a there's a reading of that life that is informed by yes the archival evidence yes what we know of the of, of, of the period in which these these authors were living and also through the books and I think with Austen almost more than any other author we are tempted to read the life in the writing we want to find her which heroine is she most like is she a Lizzie Bennett is she a Fanny Price um, and and how can she possibly have created these romantic heroes I mean the extent to which they are romantic heroes can be debated but how could she have created these romantic heroes without knowing romance herself mm. so mm. a lot gets read into Tom Lefroy yes absolutely <laughs> absolutely um and I think yeah that idea of kind of biography being um it sort of gets replicated as well those early kind of biographies do get repeated and repeated and they become this kind of solid basis for for something yeah. that actually we don't we don't know much Abs about. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So I suppose that sort of um, moves us quite nicely into um, week two and into thinking about, well, how did how did Jane Austen become so popular? Um, how did Jane Austen become so famous? I think um, right in the beginning, uh, uh, I think it was section two point one in, mm. in uh, yeah in the second week, um, a couple of people commented, you know, yeah. how has she become so famous now? And what did actually what did fame mean to Jane Austen as well? Um, what was she thinking about her own fame? Because of course the biographies say, you know, she wasn't thinking about fame. She was persuaded into yeah. publishing, and she did so in a very kind of reticent way. Yeah. Um, but actually, there are indications in her letters that that wasn't how she felt at all. Oh, absolutely, mm. absolutely. And and this has been the lovely thing about 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 the course and about the comments board is actually how many of you have been recommending things you have read to other participants. And one of the strongest recommendations for those who haven't read them is get Deirdre Le Fay's edition of the letters and look at mm. the letters because mm. she is so interesting about what, what the act of composition means and, and how much she views it as, as work. You know, this is this is labour for her. This is this is her I mean, we can't think of it really in terms of a profession. Um, but but this th this is her work and she talks about um, that wonderful letter where she writes that the nephews and nieces have left and she has um, moments of contemplation to to think about her writing again and she, she says wonderfully um composition seems to me to be impossible with a head full of joints of mutton and doses of rhubarb and I think I think that's that perfect isn't it you know the domestic concerns the looking after um, looking after children and making sure everyone's fed and watered um, stops her from writing and writing is what she wants to do which is interesting in a sort of um, perspective of um, kind of feminist literary history mm. because that is something that comes up again and again in even sort of modern 20th oh, century absolutely. I'm the pram in the hall and the <laughs> and yeah, yeah, those sorts of yeah, writers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so and Margaret Drabble, who came up in one of the comments as being someone who who doesn't much like Austen, but is preoccupied with those concerns about how does one how does one write with the pram in the hall, mm -hmm. how does one write with the with, with the dinner to prepare mm -hmm. and without the room of one's own. Mm -hmm. Um, so I suppose we should also think a little bit about um some of the comments on um, adaptation and translation. And it, yeah. um, it became clear that actually, yeah, these things are quite similar practices in many ways, that the theories behind them that are 
um, yeah, are interestingly kind of um, similar. And some of the conversations I think that were coming up on the message boards um, were also very interesting. So conversations that involved things like questions of fidelity, yep. um, how true to the original is something, and how much does that matter? Yeah. So I think there was a big conversation about um, Isabel Montelieu's oh, yes. uh, uh, changing of the exactly. ending of Sense so and the, the wonderful Isabel de Montelieu. And I, th- I think there we have to t- think in very much in terms of what did the 18th century reader expect of a translation? What do they think it's supposed to be doing? What do publishers want to happen? Jane Austen does have a comment on translation in her letters, as you as you know, Kim. So there's a there's a section where she's reading a work by um, Stephanie Felicité de Genlis called Alphonsine, and she said Alphonsine did not do. It has um, indelicacies um, that hitherto didn't grace a pie- pen so impure. I can't remember the exact reference, but it's easy enough to, re- to look up. It's from 1808. And she says, independent of a bad translation, this is a, this is a, um, a work that we shouldn't be reading. And they put it aside and, and read something else. And we don't know what she means by bad translation. Mm. I mean, is this just, um, is, she, is she comparing it to the original? Is she looking, is, is, is it the language is hack work and so therefore she isn't enjoying it? Um, what makes it a bad translation? Well, the critics are often saying, in fact, what a translator should be doing is modifying the text to make it more suited to the, to the receiving culture. So Isabel de Montelieu is doing exactly the right thing for the Swiss, the Franco-Swiss reading public, who are much more steeped in the novel of sense of sensibility than the British readership is in the period. So they want a Marianne Dashwood who's constantly fainting and throwing <laughs> herself at Brandon's feet. They want that moment of redemption that comes when Willoughby's wife dies and he marries um, Eliza and legitimises that child. They want the bad boy to reform. Um, and of course, it's not Jane Austen. It isn't Jane Austen. But Isabel de Montelieu was a European brand. She's the big name in the period. So so um, she has that liberty. We tend to think of Austen as, as, as sacred. And then, of course, she wasn't. I think, I mean, the idea of sort of sacredness, though, is, is also really interesting. I mean, at what point do um, adaptations become kind of irreverent yeah. um, and how much does that matter? I mean, some people on the message threads have mentioned things like uh, Longbourn yes. um, and novels and adaptations that kind of um, explore the silences in Austen's yes. work. And I think those are really interesting. Yeah. Um, but then there are also novels that kind of, um, yeah, take liberties, I suppose, um, with the original text. When does something become kind of based on rather than yeah. um, rather than, than uh, an adaptation? Yeah. Um, there have been some fascinating discussions of um, Clueless, I think, in particular. Um, lots and lots of v- quite varied um, understandings of, of that. Mm. Um and also discussions around this word Austen-esque as well. I think some people have felt very much that this is quite a sort of lazy term which enables people to use um, Austen as a kind of brand to sell something yeah. that's sort of subpar. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And it, it's worth, I think, maybe reading out um, uh, Rosemary Wake's comment mm-hmm. here. Austen-esque strikes me as a lazy term used by those who attempt to reach a market by hitching an inferior product to a successful brand rather than by focusing on the substance of whatever they are promoting. And this question of Austen as brand is a, a, a really important one for this section of the course, I think, where we were thinking about literary tour and the heritage industry. There was a wonderful um, article written um, last year uh, in an Australian periodical um, focusing on the bicentenary of Austin and focusing on um, Austin... people who, who are doing literary pilgrimages to Austin land and to England in the bicentenary of her birth. And it starts by quoting a gardener at the Landscape Garden, Starhead, who says, Jane Austen never came here, but she should have done. <laughs> and just thinking in terms of what the National Trust um, and places that, um, that Austen films have been tr- produced on, this is vital to heritage income. You know, and it really is important that um, these places can brand themselves as somewhere with an Austen affiliation because the heritage industry and culture in general needs the Austen 
pound. Mm. <laughs> you know, it needs these tourists to come. It's mm. vital to, to Chawton, um, to both the Jane Austen House Museum and to Chawton House. And it really is this sort of sense of literary pilgrimage is an important one. And um, I, am, I am sporting here some Jane Austen branding myself. <laughs> this is from the Bodleian's exhibition last year, a silk scarf um, printed with her manuscript, The Watsons. Um, this makes money for the Bodleian Library. Um, and it's it's tempting to scoff at this um, and it's tempting to, um, to to view it as, well, your word vampiric, I mm. think, is a good one, you know, and, and Rosemary Wake's, um, uh, you know, h h hitching an inferior product to a successful brand, I think, is important too. But mm. heritage industry needs to make money. Mm. I mean, I suppose one of the other kind of um, good things that comes out of this is um, is uh, perhaps more, more kind of literary mm. in that um, a focus on... Austin, the Austin-esque, Austin-like um, uh, uh, novels opens up an entire world of 18th century fiction yeah. um, written by women. Yeah. So um, yeah. Joan Greenleaf, uh, yes. one of our participants, um, talked about, um, it's in the section, Is Mansfield Park Austin's Most Radical Novel? Yeah. And she was asking some really interesting questions about well, what do we actually mean by radical? Um, mm. And suggesting that we do more to kind of situate Jane Austen within um, a feminist literary history, which I thought was really, Great really idea, interesting yeah, and yeah. a really good idea. And of course, um, you, what you and I have spent our careers yeah. thus far doing, yeah. um, and what we do very much at Chawton House is, mm. is Austen among women, um, mm -hmm. among her mm -hmm. among her contemporaries. So, but I think, yeah. I mean, it also opens up these really fascinating questions about can Canon making, um, yep. you know, what gets to be canonical? Why is Austen held up above all of these other contemporary women writers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how is she drawing on her predecessors as well? I think was an interesting question that was asked. Yeah. Um, because we don't know for sure what she read, no. um, but there are kind of certain tropes and certain interests that are reflected mm. from um, early and mid-century fiction. So I think you mentioned Charlotte Lennox's absolutely um, the female quicksand, quicks and we which... do we do know she read that one. But did mm -hmm. she read any Eliza Haywood? I would like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, 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 it seems that she must have, but we can't definitively mm -hmm. prove that. And then again, that's this is back to the problem of the archive, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This is the, the problem of how do we know what we think we know in relation mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. Austen. So, yeah, that's sort of fascinating. I mean, just to go back to adaptation as well, I mean, it, it is very easy to to sniff at costume dramas and, and to, to think of the text as, as, as the, the pure product. But if nothing else... Those BBC adaptation, those films do bring some people to the to the mm -hmm. book, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think that I don't think we should knock that. You mm -hmm. know, if 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 Kira Knightley as Lizzie Bennet could bring a new generation of readers to Pride and Prejudice, that seems to me to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. But also to to draw out those silences in yes. the text as well, to think about class or to think about slavery. I mean, there are yeah. these fascinating discussions about what's actually there in Austen's novel yeah. um, and, and what gets sort of um, uh, thought about subsequently and, and rewritten into the text. It provides us new ways of reading these these old texts. And I think, I mean, that's one of the things that um, it has become clear is, is the reason for Austen's lasting fame is that these are um, fundamentally kind of adaptable texts. They're texts yeah. that speak to modern audiences in, in ways that continue to be um, relevant and interesting. I yes, suppose. absolutely. Yeah. And we make them relevant and interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so comparing Austen to her, her, her more... Um, more acclaimed contemporaries, so I'm thinking here of Mariah Edgeworth and Frances Burney, who both get name-checked in, in her famous defence of the novel in Northanger Abbey. And Mariah Edgeworth and Frances Burney, in terms of editions, now need much more glossing, don't they? I mean, you, you you can't you can't bring a you can't bring a student to to Mariah Edgeworth cold. She's very steeped in mm. the politics of the period. So we had you look at editions and look at paratextual presentation. And does Austen need notes? Well, not quite as many as Mariah Edgeworth yeah, needs. Probably not. Um, yeah. Which is not to say that you shouldn't all go off and, and, and read uh, Belinda, which is a fabulous novel. Please do. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Belinda, Camilla. And um, and Evelina, Evelina would, yeah. would would be great places to start for your for the, your further reading. Um, waiting for us to design the MOOC on um, <laughs> on early women writer, which I think is something that both of us would love to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so closing up here, um, we did take on board um, the extensive comments on this is too short, um, and I think there's the, there's sort of a couple of things to say about this. I mean, the course was always designed to be about um, Jane Austen 
posthumous reputation and reception. Um, so it was never going to be about close readings of the novels. We hope you'll all go off and do that now. But we did take on board um, that two weeks even for the content we had, wasn't long enough. So we're going to be looking now into making it into a three-week course for the next run. There will be new material, there's going to be new content, um, so come back and join us for that three-week course when it, when it runs um, next. Mm. And of um, course, I should add to that as well, that we would absolutely love to see those of you who are UK-based or UK visiting um, at Chawton House as well. So if you do get the chance mm. to come and visit, drop in and say hello to us. There's lots and lots going on over the summer and, and uh, right up until December actually um, so you're very welcome to come and uh, to come and see us there absolutely and ditto the University of Southampton I mean what we were really determined to do and I think we've done it very successfully is show the range of expertise we have here in the um, in in humanities um, and especially in English and and in film and in history on 18th century literature and culture we're really fortunate to work with such great colleagues and we hope you'll come and see us so that's a goodbye from us. Goodbye and keep commenting and we'll be dipping in as and when we can. <laughs>